Welcome everyone to Yale. We're very excited to get things underway. Uh, my name is Andrew Quintman uh, from the Department of Religious Studies, and I'm joined here by my colleague Sarah Schmetterman on the Department of Anthropology. Uh, as your host today, we're hoping this doesn't look too much like the, the Oscars where we're standing up here and kind of reading off the, 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 the five nominees. Uh, but we have just a few very brief introductory remarks uh, before uh, we get into uh, our discussion and some matters at hand. So I'm going to turn over the microphone for a moment to Sarah, and then I'll say a few concluding remarks as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andy, and thanks for being here this morning, everybody who is here. Uh, you've traveled from far and wide, some this morning, some uh, over the last week, and uh, remarkably, everyone has made it. Um, despite snow and other kinds of obstacles. Um, so thank you for taking time to be with us. It's wonderful to see everybody who's here together in this room. Um, many of the people here have inspired my own scholarly trajectory over time in one way or, an or another. I recall many discussions held with all of you in Kathmandu, Lhasa, Gangtok, Ithaca, Charlottesville, Cambridge, and many other places over time. I'm meeting many other colleagues and students here anew, always a wonderful feeling of excitement to engage with fresh um, and new friends to talk with. Everyone here in some way has cultivated a deep commitment to producing knowledge about the Himalayan region. It gives me great pleasure to be able to welcome you all to New Haven and Yale University now. Some of the connections between us all in this room are explicit. Some of us know each other well and have read others' work while others are implicit or as yet unknown, and one of the things that we hope will happen here is discovery of those kinds of as yet unknown connections. The title of our workshop here, of course, is Himalayan Connections, and I want to speak in a bit more detail about what we've envisioned that to mean and how we hope that this phrase will frame our conversations over the next two days. The idea for this workshop emerged in conversations between myself and Andy Quintman last year. We felt that our own engagement in the Himalaya had been strongly shaped by disciplinary training and anthropology and religious studies respectively, but that we had much to learn from each other and also that we had both over time benefited greatly from conversations with many other colleagues uh, across, across a wide range of disciplines. Here at Yale, we'd also begun a set of discussions uh, with colleagues across fields as diverse as forestry and environmental studies, history of art and public health, who had begun to come together at Yale under the aegis of the Yale Himalaya Initiative. We felt that it was time for a broader interdisciplinary conversation about how the idea of the Himalaya has been invoked as an analytical category by a range of scholarly actors over time, and how we might most productively engage with and contribute to knowledge about, uh, but also dynamics in this particular region in the future. And we hope that the workshop here is the beginning of such an endeavor. What happens here today and tomorrow will by no means be definitive. We have no illusions about that. There are many people and perspectives missing around the table this time for a host of inevitable logistical reasons. But we've done our best to bring together scholars from a range of disciplinary perspectives and institutional settings whose research has been grounded in equally diverse locales across the Himalayan region. We've also invited several sympathetic listeners to comment on presentations who may not themselves work directly in the Himalaya, but who recognize the importance of the concerns that we address here for a more expansive discussion of what in France has often been called High Asia, or perhaps even Asia full stop. Although we here may start from a working definition of the Himalaya or Himalaya that encompasses high altitude regions of Nepal, India, Bhutan, Pakistan, and China, as well as the Tibetan cultural areas that traverse the borders of all of those states. We hope that the insights generated from close empirical attention to the historical and contemporary dynamics of these areas may illuminate broader questions about disciplinary histories scale and geography, identity and mobility, environment and religion, literary and visual representation, and states and borders. These themes, uh, which as you may recognize are the themes of the panels, um, open up several avenues of inquiry as we strive to understand the Himalaya as a significant transnational space for research and practice, 
whose location at the edges of traditional area studies units of Southeast and Southeast Asia demands creative academic approaches. Moreover, these themes compel us to consider in depth how and why the Himalaya has been invoked as a unifying concept, whether in environmental, cultural, political, linguistic, religious, or other terms, and how it both opens and forecloses analytical possibilities. Does using Himalaya as a broad regional signifier invoke some sort of ecological or cultural determinism that diminishes the specificity of political history? Or does it legitimately recognize the webs of ecological, economic, and cultural connectivity that have bound together multiple distinct entities over time? Does it bring into view the cultural continuities and forms of mobility that shape the life experiences of people in the region or obscure real differences to which we must attend? These are just a few of the questions that we might ask ourselves as we take up the long-standing debate over whether and how the idea of the Himalaya works to foreground certain worldviews and background others. How do we articulate the idea of the Himalaya with that of Tibet, for instance, and how does the Himalaya look different when viewed from its northern slopes from a so-called East Asian rather than South Asian perspective? or vice versa, and you can imagine many other uh, iterations, many other versions of these kinds of questions which we hope will be uh, asked and discussed here. Finally, we'd like to consider how the disciplinary perspectives that we bring to the table articulate with specific areas of focus within the Himalayan region in both geographical and conceptual terms. How do we see the same spaces differently as anthropologists, art historians, biologists, demographers, foresters, geographers, linguists, historians, political scientists, sociologists, scholars of the environment, religion, or literature, not to mention policy makers, entrepreneurs, or activists? When are we primarily our disciplinary selves, and when do we become Himalayanists, or Tibetologists, not to mention Indologists or South Asianists, scholars of East Asia or Central Asia, just to mention some of the many uh, disciplinary and area affiliations that people in the room may feel themselves to have. When is our scholarship expansive in disciplinary or regional terms, and when is it intentionally parochial? Why and what for? How can we together deepen knowledge about the real issues and problems that Himalayan people have faced, both now and throughout history, and the complex life worlds that they have produced? These are just a few of the questions that we might begin to address here and which we hope will be illuminated by an attention to <coughs> connections and connectivity across time between disciplines and places and most of all between people. So with that I just want to say a few words about the format that we've envisioned for um, the uh, proceedings here. Many people have asked what am I actually supposed to be doing? How am I supposed to present? Um, and we can forgive you for that confusion, but we hope that uh, you've taken it as an invitation to really engage with each other um, in a manner which is somewhere between a structured uh, conference presentation and an open, free-flowing roundtable discussion. Um, just to clarify, we've asked everybody who is a named presenter in the program to pre prepare a presentation of up to 20 minutes, which in some way addresses the set of broad framing questions for their panel. Um, and the questions are included in the program that you have here. Um, so you can look yourself and see what the issues at hand, um, how, the, how we have sketched out the issues at hand. Uh, but I am very much looking forward to seeing how you have all taken up those invitations to respond. Um, so each presenter will have approximately 20 minutes, and then there is a respondent who will have about five minutes to synthesize what they hear. Now I have to say they will be doing this on the fly, so it's perhaps the most challenging role um, here. Uh, they haven't seen papers in advance, and what we've asked of them is simply to think carefully of and, and put together a set of uh, comments which helps them to open discussion. And we should have about half an hour of discussion um, within each panel session. Um, so, Thank you all for playing along with the idea, and um, we're very excited um, to hear what everybody has to say. 
all participants included, I should say. And regardless of whether you're sitting at the table or in the chairs, whether your name is on the program or not, we sincerely hope that you will um, participate and comment. And there are microphones to enable that throughout the room. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks so much, Sarah. And let me just echo your great pleasure to be in a room filled with so many people who have uh, helped incubate my own interests in the Himalayas and have also shared those interests over, uh, over the years. Um, and I wanted to say a few words in a slightly different direction. Since the theme of our workshop is Himalayan connections, uh, it seems appropriate to say at least a few words about Yale University's own historical involvement uh, with the Himalayan region, uh, which are both broad and deep. So Yale was the first university in North America to fill an endowed position in Sanskrit when in 1854 it hired the pioneering comparative philologist William Dwight Whitney, sometimes known as the other Whitney as opposed to Eli Whitney who also was a resident in New Haven. A century later, in 1950, Yale alumnus Elliot Beach McRae traveled to India and then eventually Sikkim where he met the Maharaja Chugyal uh, Tashinamgyal who offered him this lovely Tibetan Tonka of Manjushri. Which, later, uh, which he later donated to the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, which is located just across the street. The figures in the painting were reportedly modeled after McRae's own family by the Sikkimese painter. Soon after his return, McRae became president of the publishing giant E.P. Dutton, where he arranged for the release of several climbing tales, including W.H. Murray's The Story of Everest, and the Mount Everest Reconnaissance Expedition by Eric Shipton. But among McRae's greatest publishing successes was Austrian climber Heinrich Carr's memoir, Seven Years in Tibet. Now, two years prior to McRae's visit to Sikkim in 1948, another Yale graduate from the class of 1924 was elected to uh, the governor of the state of Connecticut. This was Chester Bowles. And in 1951, uh, President Truman appointed Bowles as the third U.S. ambassador to Nepal, where he was offered this tanka of uh, Hayagriva by the king of Nepal himself. And this painting, too, resides in the Beinecke Library's collection, together with Chester Bowles' uh, uh, large collection of papers. Now, both of these paintings became the objects of close study by Wesley Needham who in 1953 became acting curator of the Beinecke's Tibetan collection. Needham maintained a warm relationship uh, with many Tibetans, including Tsepun Shakaba, the Tibetan finance minister and head of the Tibetan trade mission from 1947 to 49, who later lived in New Haven and collaborated uh, with Wesley Needham for several years. Now, Needham also worked closely at Yale with a uh, uh, renowned Mongolian reincarnate lama, the Dilawa Hutuktu. And at Needham's request, in 1949, the 14th Dalai Lama printed a copy of the 100-volume Plaza edition of the Buddha's collected teachings, the Kanjur, uh, that was printed especially for Yale. It then traveled by horse caravan from Lhasa, and then freighter from Calcutta, and eventually reached New Haven in uh, February of 1950 just about the time of McRae's own visit to Sikkim. And you can see Wesley Needham here posing with those uh, uh, volumes just after they arrived here. Now, a small fragment of these materials are currently on display in the small exhibit uh, that we have called Himalayan Collections that was curated by our South Asian librarian, Sarah Calhoun, Mark Turin, and myself. And you can see those in the small cases just outside the rear doors here and also uh, in the Beinecke Rare Book Library across the street. And we hope that these serve as a kind of amuse-bouche for Yale's rich Himalayan holdings located across the university in the Sterling Memorial Library, where we are to, uh, today, in the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, but also in the Divinity School, the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, the University Art Gallery, the Center for British Art, and the Peabody Museum of Natural History. These materials include, for example, the Himalayan Mission Archives Collection, which is the world's largest archive of missionary documents from Nepal. Uh, and you can find some uh, uh, selections from this archive, including the slide which is up here, uh, in the cases out uh, in the room behind us. Uh, but also the wonderful watercolor paintings of Samuel Davis, which were published in the 1982 Surindia volume, Medieval Views of Nepal. 
And we've incorporated details from Davis's paintings into our workshop poster and the schedule that you have in front of you. So I want to add, uh, finally, that Yale's School of Forestry and Environmental Studies uh, has maintained long-standing connections with the Himalayan region, especially in North India and Bhutan. But these connections uh, have been strengthened and expanded over the past 10 years or so, uh, largely through the work of my colleagues in religious studies, Phyllis Granoff and Koichi Shinohara, who unfortunately couldn't be here uh, to join us this weekend, as well as the generous support of a grant from the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation. Recently, the School of Public Health has established an exchange of faculty uh, from Bhutan's Royal Institute of Health Science. Now, just over two years ago, the Yale uh, Himalaya Initiative was launched, and its director, Mark Turin, uh, will say much more about its activities before our keynote panel uh, this evening, so I'll let him say more about those activities. Um, but all of this is to say, in brief, that we imagine this workshop, Himalayan Connections, not as being something entirely new at Yale, but instead of reawakening the tendril or auspicious connections that were established long ago. Okay, I have just a very few uh, words of kind of logistics to announce before uh, we finally launch into the program. So uh, we'll be in this room in the lecture hall of Sterling Memorial Library all day. Lunch will be served uh, in the room behind us, which is technically known as the memorabilia room at 1245, and we invite everyone here to join us for lunch. But I would please ask uh, that we allow the participants, uh, the name participants in our uh, program uh, to collect their lunch first, just because they're on a sort of time schedule. Uh, you're welcome to find a place to sit for lunch, either in this room, in the memorabilia room, in the hallway, or outside. You're welcome to uh, if it's nice outside, I think the sun is shining. So, uh, During the lunch break or our coffee breaks, uh, we also welcome you to visit the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, uh, where we have several lovely Tibetan tankas on, uh, on display. So the Beinecke Library, if you walk out the doors to the rear, you turn right, it's just across the street, it's the giant white kind of cube. You can't miss it. It's an extraordinarily beautiful building inside if you've never been in. Uh, you walk up the stairs to the left, it's on the mezzanine level, and the tankas are on the uh, rear end of the curved cases at the top of the stairs. Uh, unfortunately, the Beinecke closes at 5 p.m., so your only uh, opportunity to visit would be either during lunch or our coffee breaks today. Uh, the afternoon panels will again be in this room, uh, in the lecture hall, and the daytime program concludes at 5 p.m., and I would just ask that once we leave the building to please make sure that you have all of your belongings with you since it will be locked uh, promptly after we leave and we won't have access afterwards. Um, approximately 5.15, we'll have uh, some of our student volunteers uh, waiting in the back room and we'll all uh, walk up to the Loose Hall Auditorium, just about a five minutes walk from here, um, uh, which is on the first floor of Loose Hall. Uh, the keynote panel will run from 5.45 to 7.15 and we invite uh, all of you to join us for a reception and a dinner which will follow in the Loose Hall Common Room on the second floor. Um, after dinner, you're welcome to walk back to the hotel on your own. We'll also have some student volunteers who will be uh, kind of guiding you on the way down there. Uh, the program will officially end at 9 o'clock, which is when our caterers come to uh, remove all of their equipment, but you're welcome to linger uh, as, as you like. Um, finally, we'd, we'd like to let you know that uh, we are video and audio recording the entire meeting. Uh, we have a release form for our named participants that we're asking you uh, to sign and turn into the registration desk. Uh, we hope to make what we are calling or thinking of as a kind of visual proceedings of uh, the workshop available in edited form. And we also hope to publish an extended conference summary in a forthcoming issue of the journal Himalaya. Finally, uh, the, the sort of best part of the introductions is to thank all of those uh, who have helped put this uh, uh, proceeding together. So first we want to thank those institutions that have financially supported our workshop, the Edward J. and Dorothy Clark Kempf Memorial Fund, the Council on East Asian Studies, and the South Asian Studies Council at Yale University. And we also gratefully acknowledge the support uh, we, we've received from the Departments of Anthropology, the Department of Religious Studies, the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and the Yale Himalaya Initiative. Uh, we should also uh, like to thank Lena Chan, Kosturi Gupta, and Jessica Chin for all of their administrative wizardry. 
Uh, finally, our greatest thanks go to the people who really worked uh, tirelessly on the ground to help uh, bring all of you here. And that is our graduate assistant, Jacob Brink. And I know you're here somewhere. Can you stand up so people can see you? Oh, he's already working. <laughs> Jacob, take a moment off and show your face so people can see you. Um, we'd also like to thank our, uh, our student assistants, uh, Sumana Serchan, Priyankar Chand, uh, Austin Lord, and Lexi Tuningham, as well as Hunter Snyder, who is our videographer. Here's Jacob. Say hi, Jacob. So Jacob is the face behind the Himalaya.conference email that many of you have uh, corresponded with over the past few months. Uh, the workshop has also been organized in conjunction with the India-China Institute at the New School, and we'd like to thank Ashok Gurung and Georgina Drew, who are both here, um, as well as their assistant, uh, Ali uh, Schudinger, for their collaboration. And we're delighted that so many participants from their conference are able to join in our conversation here today. All right. So finally, at long last, uh, we'd now like to invite Shivi Shiva Ramakrishnan to chair our first panel. Shivi is a professor of anthropology and forestry and environmental studies here at Yale, and in his capacity as chair of the South Asian Studies Council, has been integral in developing Yale's focus on the Himalayas. So we'd like to ask all of our chairs, just as a reminder, to introduce speakers and keep time carefully. Each speaker has 20 minutes, and then the respondent will have five, so that we have uh, the rest of the time allocated uh, to open discussion. So thank you all. Hey, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, it is 9.30, so let's get uh, right down to it with an eye to trying to do everything that Sarah and Andy would like us to do. I've actually had a brief conversation with my panelists who very generously agreed to take no more than 15 minutes each to actually allow you time, given that the tea break is coming in 90 minutes or less, uh, to ask questions and have a real conversation and a discussion. So, uh, so let me just quickly tell you uh, who's speaking and in which order. Uh, there are descriptions of their accomplishments and interests in the biographical note that's in your folder, so I won't read all of that out. I just wanted to point out that this opening session is uh, trying to provide you with some views about how the study of the Himalaya has developed from particular disciplinary perspectives and uh, each speaker is well known in their particularly dis disciplinary approach and of course is the, has a long been a contributor to trying to make things more interdisciplinary as well. Uh, we'll first hear uh, from Professor Curtis Schaefer who is at the University of Virginia and is a professor of uh, religions. Then we'll hear from uh, Professor Kamal Bawa, who uh, is a professor of biology uh, at the University of Massachusetts in Boston, and most recently, the author of Himalaya, Mountains of Life, which came out literally just a couple of months ago. Uh, then Catherine March from Cornell, uh, who's an anthropologist and uh, a longtime scholar of Nepal. And uh, lastly, Jeffrey Samuel from Cardiff, both a historian and a religionist with also interests in uh, early period studies, archaeology, and so on. So uh, they'll each take, as I noted uh, very kindly, no more than 15 minutes. And then we'll hear from Peter Perdue, who is over there. Uh, Peter, going to come over here? Yeah, why don't you take the chair in the middle? Uh, uh, who's a historian at, of China at Yale. And uh, once Peter's done in no more than five minutes, we should still have about 20 minutes before the coffee break. So welcome all, and I won't stand up here again, we'll just go in the order I've mentioned. Good morning. Um, let me say a few words about a discipline that I suppose I identify with, um, which is literary history. You might say. I was trained in a Lang and Lit department, and I teach in a department of religious studies, uh, which is probably most of you know if you know the North American um, uh, world of uh, higher education. You know that when you study a particular culture's religious traditions, in great part you teach those religious traditions. So 
sometimes to the exclusion of everything else. But I was trained as someone who deals with texts, and I was trained as a philologist um, and, and, and a historian. Um, and so I guess one of the first questions I, I want to ask, although I don't know that if it's how relevant it will be for conversation today, is, uh, is what is a discipline? Um, I ask that because I know that all of us find ourselves in an uneasy relationship with the disciplines that we're expected to represent at times. Um, but one answer for me, I asked myself that question as, we were start, as, as I was preparing for this, and one answer I came up with is a discipline, um, you know a discipline when, when you feel it. Um, not when you see it necessarily, but when you feel it. You know that you're a part of something um, closer to something, farther away to, some, than to something else, when you feel it. And let me give you an example, um, a conversation a long time ago, a decade or, or so ago with, a, with an art historian, um, showed me w where my feeling lies. And um, we were talking about uh, looking at uh, old murals in uh, temples in central Tibet. And um, she said, uh, at one point, to uh, make a space to photograph uh, murals and examine murals, she had to step around and over large piles of uh, manuscripts sitting on the ground. And my heart leapt into my, into my throat, and I, I was speechless, right? But of course, this was a perfectly reasonable thing to do, given her obsessions, right? And it was a perfectly reasonable um, uh, response for me, and it, it showed me where my obsessions lie. So for, for, for better or for worse. Um, so what I want to do for the next few minutes is sketch out um, a, a, a periodized uh, to, uh, European uh, engagement with uh, Tibetan language literature, particularly biography, which is something that has meant a lot to me. Um, and I think there's a good case to be made for biography being very important uh, as a genre and as an object of focus. Uh, in the study of Tibetan language literature from the Himalayas, because you see it at the beginning moments of the encounter with, um, uh, with Tibetan literature. So I, I tried to think of a periodization that would be helpful for thinking about different types of, um, different types of scholarship, different types of research, but also different kinds of limitations too. And I came up with a fourfold periodization, which is not this, we'll get to this in a second. Okay? We'll get to this in the, the, the latter fourth of the talk. Um, and I came up with um, an era of exploration, an era of collection, an era of cataloging, and an era of macro analysis. So we'll, 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 let me talk, let me run through those, okay? Expedition, collection, cataloging, macro analysis. And this is a historic, this is a periodization. And I, I think it's, it's, um, it leaves out a lot, but I think it fo focuses on certain trends that are useful to, for us to assess and place ourselves within today. Um, so the study of Tibetan language literature in the Himalayas uh, began in earnest, I would say, with David Snellgrove's expeditions in the 50s and his publications beginning in the late 50s uh, up into the 60s. And he published what he considered to be a trilogy of works, Buddhist Himalaya, Himalayan Pilgrimage, that's 57 and 61, and then finally Four Lamas of Dolpo in 1967, which was, he thought, the, the culmination of his work beginning in the 50s. And these are fascinating works. They're inspirational works uh, uh, still. Um, there, there's a high degree of romance in some of them, especially Buddhist Himalaya, um, especially at the end of that work. Um, and I'm sure our assessment of that looks very different than, than the reception of the book did in the 60s, in the late 50s and 60s. Um, and uh, it's important, I think, uh, to get a sense of the distance between now and then. When Snellgrove began, we had approximately zero Tibetan language biographies of uh, uh, religious leaders from that area. I'm sure that's an overstatement. Now, today, we can get our hands on approximately 1,000 of them, thanks in great part to uh, the Nepal Journal Manuscript Preservation Project, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. So we've gone from almost none to more than anybody can read in a lifetime over the space of about four decades. And that's, a, that's very significant. And I think we're still 
trying to figure out what to do with, to do with that. If, if we want to do anything different about that and what we're going to do about that. And let's maybe read a little bit of, let me read just a tiny bit of Snellgrove. You can get a sense of what he was about. Let's see here. Okay, he has this, um, in, in, in Four Lamas of Dopo, he has this habit of translating all Tibetan proper names into uh, English, which he says, well, that's what the Tibetans did, so that's what I'm, with Sanskrit, so that's what I'm going to do. Hmm? Um, let's see here. I first read through the original manuscript, uh, checking all difficulties, doubtful passages with the Lama, and then handed the, the corrected photos on to Tsering Tashi, whose only failing was to try to write too much without referring to his master copy. Even the best scribes, and one judges a scribe by the beauty of his writing, may not know the rules of grammar and spelling at all well. And as there were so many types of writing um, uh, uh, the same sound, so many ways of writing the same sound in Tibetan, there is constant risks of error if he tries to write a whole passage without glancing back at the text he is copying. So I, I won't read any more right now, but he's very concerned with the philological issues that come up with, with, with the text. He's, he's concerned with that and grappling with that in the field because he's bringing back handwritten copies. Right? Um, so this is, this, this is a change I think we take for granted now since we've moved through um, photography into digital photography. Um, so it's a rad radically different um, uh, method of collection now. Um, but he sees himself as, as starting something new. Um, he says at the end of the introduction to Four Lamas of Dopo um, that the reader may be surprised to find that these biographies are somewhat mundane because the only thing that you'll have to compare them to is uh, uh, the, the, the third eye by Lopsang Rampa. So he's, he sees himself as jump-starting a field uh, from uh, a popular fascination to something different. Yeah. Now the next person I would put in, in, that, um, in that lineage is Michael Aris, and I'm thinking primarily of one article. It's a report on uh, an expedition to Kutang and Nupri in, uh, north, in northwestern Nepal, 1973. And that's, again, these guys were great writers, I think that's part of the reason that they, they, they remain inspiring for those of us who read them. Um, in about 40 pages, he details um, an eight-day trip, and he spends a lot of time uh, describing the biographical and autobiographical literature that he found um, in Kutan. And, um, uh, and he brought back to, uh, in the form of uh, photographs to the University of California. Uh, by today's standards, uh, it's a very small collection that he came away with. It's, it's only a handful of work, 20, 24 works, um, and several hundred folios. So it's, it's, it's a pittance um, in comparison. But this is an article I, I, that has um, uh, that's laid out a lot of the groundwork for the study of, um, of uh, Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist history in the Himalayas. Uh, and I, I, I learned yesterday anthropology, too, because as Jeff Childs and I were sitting at the airport yesterday, he told me that that was one of the articles that inspired him to to go into academia in the first place. So I thought that was uh, fun. And you can read the, the, the best scholarship to date about uh, those, uh, the, the three autobiographies, um, biographies and autobiographies that uh, Aris describes most in, those, in that article is Jeff Child's uh, Tibetan Diary. So it's the work of an anthropologist, not, not a historian or a literary historian. So if we move from uh, this era of more or less personal uh, expeditions uh, to the 80s and the 90s, we think of uh, we can think of that area as, as the era of collection. And there are two great um, efforts in this. One is the Library of Congress, um, uh, who was looking not just, not simply at the Himalayas, of course, but Tibet overall, um, and um, uh, uh, trying to to deal with in a triage situation with the with the Tibetan diaspora and the, and the literature that was coming over the border. And of course, that was Gene Smith, which later transformed into the Tibetan Buddhist Resource Center, which is something else again. But the other big effort uh, is the Nepal German Manuscript Preservation Project, which I think is really the most successful um, uh, uh, manuscript preservation project um, uh, to date, uh, uh, develop, developed uh, by, uh, uh, by, by a European group. And oh, between 83 
1983 and 2001, they launched 37 expeditions into uh, the Nepal Himalayas. Um, they collected photographs in 1,000, slightly over 1,000 reels of microfilms. Um, and this uh, um, translates into, I believe it's about 37 or 38,000 individual titles for, uh, for, the, for the upper Himalayas. This is uh, uh, not including uh, uh, Kathmandu, where they actually did a lot of their filming as well. Um, so this was this is a simply amazing effort. Um, what I do as someone who was trained in the 90s and has worked throughout the zeros uh, simply wouldn't be possible without this effort. And um, uh, and today we've trans that effort is translated into something different again. And I call the the, the effort in the 2000s uh, the the era of cataloging. And this is this is the time when these massive collections developed by the Library of Congress and by Gene Smith, uh, Gene Smith in his personal library, which then became the TBRC library, and the NGMPP um, uh, uh, were cataloged to, um, uh, to a highly useful degree, I should say. Um, so today we can, uh, we can go online um, and uh, visit the University of Hamburg uh, uh, database for the um, Nepal German Manuscript Preservation um, Project, punch in Namtar, Tibetan word for biography, and get a thousand hits. Right? Um, that's exciting. It's a great, it's a great finding aid. Um, and again, it's more than any one of us could read. Uh, what we're seeing today, and it's the same with the TVRC, right? Um, so but what, what we're seeing today uh, is, uh, is, is a change again, especially in our relationship to that massive amount of bibliographic data that we have. And so I call this era the, the age of, uh, of, of macro analysis. Huh? This, is, this is a time when we ask ourselves, what are we going to do with all of this data? Right? It's a sort of, um, in, a, in, a, for, in, in poor man's terms, um, uh, in other words, for humanists, uh, in humanist terms, uh, this is the problem with big data, right? It's not really big data because the data that we're working with is, is, is so relatively small relative to other areas that so it's, that's a going concern. Um, uh, but we have a chance now to study large scale trends in literature, connections with other areas of life beyond literature, uh, and we have the chance to transform how we treat biography. Up for the past several decades, we've treated biography largely from the inside out. Right? It's because we're fascinated with the people. I think people who read biography um, uh, begin to do so and they keep on doing so because, um, uh, because they, meet, uh, uh, they meet rich lives in an imaginative setting. Historians mostly read biography. Sometimes it's the worst, uh, it's the worst possible uh, uh, source material for doing history. Right? In Tibet, uh, in uh, on, the, on the north side of the Himalayas, we read biography in large part because we don't have great access to documentary evidence. Right? It's a little bit different in the, in, on the south side of the Himalayas. Um, so um, one of the things that's, um, that's really impacted this, uh, the, the um, uh, the encounter with massive um, amounts of data is what's been called the spatial move in the humanities. The, uh, the opportunity to use basic uh, uh, GIS techniques, basic mapping techniques to create portals for information, but also to structure interpretations of information too. Um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is exciting, it's, it's very messy uh, at the moment, it may not ever be uh, a clean process. Uh, and this is what I wanted to, I wanted to show you one example from my own work, um, not in Tibetan studies, uh, but, uh, but uh, it's an example of um, some work I did in the classroom setting, uh, and it's about Jefferson. So the question is, well, if you have great or good, let's say, um, bibliographic data for literature, what can you do with it besides find a particular text? Well, it turns out, depending on what kind of information you have, you can do a lot. Um, if you turn your vision of biography inside out, if you stop looking from the, outs, from, from, from the inside out and you look from the outside in. Uh, so this is, a, this is a, a study of the first library at the University of Virginia. 
which Thomas Jefferson founded. He handpicked the library at the end of his life. It was about 3,500 volumes. It was the largest startup library um, in, a, in a university in American history. It was not the largest library, um, uh, even in 1819. And what I challenge students to do, because this is something uh, that I built with a, a colleague of mine in Bill Furster, who's a programmer uh, and, and a software designer, uh, and a student. This all, we, we did this all in class. And I challenged the students to take a catalog of the first library at the University of Virginia and, and make something about it. Specifically, we charged them to visualize that. Right? And so what they came up with um, was uh, a, a very basic map and also a bookshelf, too. So what we've done is we took the, the, the relatively scant information that um, was afforded to us in the catalog, and which was the, the, the author, the title, uh, the language, the number of uh, pages or folios, uh, and, uh, and the publication date and the publication loca uh, location. And we, we, uh, we mapped it. Right? So now you can go through any particular book and you can see where it comes from. So you can also search that, like if you search natural, and you can get a bunch of hits, and we can see that it is published there. You can do philosophy, and where did it go? Went over, went over there. So in very simple terms, we've added a, a, we've added a geographic component to, um, to a, 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 a cataloging database. And in a classroom setting, we've then turned that around to allow people to ask new questions about the shape <coughs> and the significance of the first library at UVA. And we've essentially what we brought the students to was a, a very um, uh, um, a, sh a shallow but but very intriguing sense that the first library at the University of Virginia was a part of late Enlightenment culture. Yeah. So this kind of uh, what is now relatively uh, 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 simple work to translate one form of information into a variety of different visualizations um, is easily applicable in Nepal and would, pr would provide an intensely powerful means to ask new questions about the place of biography in local settings, regional trends uh, of biographical writing and practice surrounding uh, biographical text. Uh, what we don't have and what we desperately need uh, to, to begin to pull that off is an integration of analytical tools that are already out there and uh, information retrieval systems like uh, uh, bibliographic databases. Now I'll give you an example of why this is, this is, this is, this is, this is urgent is too strong a word, um, but what this is really an, an important thing to focus on. I asked, um, in, in some other work on the growth of, growth of literary criticism in Tibetan biography, I wanted to ask when did literary criticism uh, emerge in Tibet and why did it emerge? To do that, I wanted to look um, uh, throughout a large swath of time, and I wanted to look through uh, the, the, the plateau um, in as broad a terms as I could. And I was able to do that because TBRC was able to give me um, or their, their raw data in the form of a, um, of a CSV file, which I was able to put into a spreadsheet and basically hand work geographic data and, uh, uh, and, and, and temporal data and come up with an answer. The rise of literary criticism in Tibet occurs at a moment when, bi when biographical writing um, explodes. There more, there's more of it, but they also become bigger and more complex works too. So that was an argument I wanted to make. Um, but taking that data out of an already existing database and sticking it into a spreadsheet um, was like taking the engine out of a Maserati, sticking it in a Ford truck, and asking why the Ford truck's not making the turn very well at, at 150 miles an hour, right? It's an absolutely ridiculous thing to do. So we need to have better integration of these tools. And I think the NGMPP, the Nepal German Manuscript Preservation Project, 
database is a good example of that. Um, to do the kind of work that um, offers uh, interesting visualizations, interesting connections, it serves as a platform for asking new questions about localities and uh, 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 pan-regional issues, we need to integrate analytical tools and the information that we have. Um, and ideally, what this will lead to is not, um, not a teleological, not, 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 not an endpoint based uh, uh, program of research, but it'll end in um, a, a dialectic between those four moments that I've sketched over the last several decades. Uh, expedition, field research we might say, uh, um, uh, be more happy with now, collection, cataloging, and analysis. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Good morning, and I really appreciate this opportunity to share my thoughts with you. And Shibi, I hope my 15 minutes start now. I don't want to be held responsible for the omissions and commissions of past or future speakers. Actually, if I was a Buddhist, I would need no time at all. I could close my eyes, you could close your eyes, and you could read my mind. When I put this title here, Himalayan Studies and Perspectives from Sustainability Science, my colleague, Dr. Reinmar Seidler, who is here, and some of my students whose work I will be reporting, Uttam, and Alexa, he said, sustainability science, Himalayan studies? He said, that's not Himalayan studies. I said, no. We met in New York. We talked about religion and sustainability. He said, no. I said, no, they invited me to talk about sustainability. He said, no, give me another argument. I don't buy it. But I think sustainability science or sustainability is very critical to the issues we have been discussing during the last two days in New York and the issues we'll be discussing during the next two days. Quest for sustainability, I think we all know, is going to be the dominant theme of this century. And we have to find to strengthen these connections which Sarah has been talking about by bringing various disciplines which are represented in this room to bear upon critical questions about sustainability. Before I address uh, very thoughtful questions posed by Sarah and the organizers, I want to tell you who we are, what we do. And by we, I mean my own research group and the institution, Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, ATRI, that I founded in Bangalore 15 years ago, which deals with basically generation of interdisciplinary knowledge that can engage a wide variety of stakeholders. And I'll elaborate on that, on that mission as we go along. Our focus are two biodiversity hotspots of India, the Western Ghats along the west coast of India, and the Himalaya. And we have a core staff of 22 fellows. These are also called faculty members, and I'll tell you why in a minute, who lead independent programs. Together, we have a staff of about 190 people. The organization is only 15 years old. But I'm very happy to report that a University of Pennsylvania study last month ranked us number 19th globally among environmental think tanks and number one in Asia. So we are very proud of our achievements of our faculty and staff. We are organized very differently to generate this interdisciplinary knowledge. We are not organized along disciplines, but around issues. 
social scientists, historians, anthropologists, natural scientists working together to, to address the critical issues. We have two virtual centers, Center for Biodiversity and Conservation and Center for Environment and Development. And that under these two centers, we have two programs each. Lack of time, I won't describe these programs, you can read. And then we have an Academy for Conservation Science and Sustainability Studies, which anchors our academic programs. And the centerpiece of that academic program is a new, innovative, interdisciplinary program in conservation and sustainability studies that currently enro enrolls about 35 doctoral students. The degree is given by Manipal University. Our Himalayan program has several components, global environmental change, and I'll be talking about that in a little bit more detail later. Ecosystem services, including livelihoods, policy institutions and governance that are related to global environmental change and issues around livelihoods that very much depend upon ecosystem services provided by the region, exploration and discovery, and human resources. Our focal area is Eastern Himalaya, Indian part of the Eastern Himalaya, primarily Darjeeling and Sikkim in the shadows of Kanchanjunga and Gurudumara Lake in North Sikkim. And I just want to show you the just incredible biological and cultural diversity of this region and also shamelessly paddle my book from which these images come. Primroses, center of origin and diversification. Impatience, hundreds of species, very poorly described. And the British naturalist Joseph Hooker and Darwin had correspondence about impatience in the Eastern Himalaya, wondering about their diversity and evolution. Rhododendrons, about 100 species on the Indian side and about 300 species on the Chinese side. Again, a center of origin and diversification for another genus. And very intricate relationships between sunbirds and rhododendrons. Tremendous cultural diversity, we all know about it. Twined, intertwined with the biological diversity. And all this biological diversity sustaining livelihoods of millions of people in the region. And the region is undergoing very, very rapid change. We all know that. There are several components of this change. Land use change, pushing agricultural frontiers into the wilderness areas, but you can't blame these small farmers for deforestation. These are marginalized community, communities occupying very marginal lands because they have no other place to go. Climate change. Our work has shown that Himalayas have warmed about 1.5 degrees centigrade over a 20 year period from 1982 to 2006. This is three times the global average increase of temperature. Precipitation. The patterns of precipitation have been changing and ecosystems are responding to those changes and local communities are responding to those changes. This is scientific data. We have collected mass of data about local perceptions of climate change 
and how these changes are affecting their livelihoods and their agricultural practices. Hydropower. We had quite a bit of discussion about that in New York. Basically, 300 dams going to be built on this side of the Himalaya during the next 20 years, and about 400 dams on the other side of the Himalaya on the Chinese side during the next 20 years will change the hydrology of the rivers on which people depend. So where, we, where do we stand? Uh, what, is, what, what are we doing in terms of sustainability science? What are we doing in terms of global environmental change? And I just illustrate the very complex challenges, and I'm taking just one component of our program, and then I'm going to take just one element of that program to illustrate the challenges. The focus is how do we build the resilience of these social ecological systems in the region to the tremendous change that is underway. And we are particularly concerned with vulnerability. We have to prioritize which communities, which regions are most vulnerable. How do we determine that? Three components of vulnerability, sensitivity, exposure, and adaptive capacity. I'm not going to go into the details. Many of you are familiar with these terms. But I think to illustrate the complexity of this issue, and this is the slide Reinmar Seidler prepared for me last evening, the interdisciplinary challenges. And you can read it. I, I'm not going to, again, because of lack of time, repeat what is there. But the issue here is when we frame these questions about vulnerability from a scientific point of view, we have a very different set of questions. We collect very different set of data. When we do it from a human security point of view or from a social science perspective, the questions are very different. The data we collect are very different. The policy changes we want to make are very different. And we have to bring these together. And this is a challenge. And this is a challenge we are trying to meet and our group is trying to meet. Coming now to questions posed by the organizers. Himalayan studies so far. What are the disciplinary concerns? And I'm only taking this issue of natural science management, both in the Darjeeling area and to some extent in Sikkim area. There has been a very narrow focus on ecology of extraction of resources. First it was tea. Then it was timber that was extracted. If you look, hookers, Himalayan journals, if you read those, and that is the time in 1840s. He talks about coming out of the place he was staying and looking around. And all around he could see dense forests. And now you go to Darjeeling and you come out. All you see are tea estates. Extraction or conversion of the land for tea was followed by extraction of timber. Many natural forests were replaced by Cryptomedia japonica. And the point here is the interests of the state dominated the interests of the community in communities, local communities, in terms of local ecologies.
Not only that, in many of these ecological studies, whatever little work was being done in terms of the local community perspectives, there was huge gender balance that still remains. Women play a very critical role in natural resource management and use of natural resources in the Himalaya, but that concern is barely the target of studies, was target of the past studies. It's barely the target of current studies. It's barely on the agenda of sustainable development. Organizers asked, is change occurring? Yes, there is some change. There are new perspectives, but the change is very slow. Change is very slow in terms of the type of knowledge we are trying to generate, type of institutions we need, but the change is very fast, whether we talk about the environment, or whether we are dealing with economic change, or social change, or cultural change. What sort, of, what sort of institutional configurations have shaped our knowledge? That was another question. Largely external actors. And I'm not talking about external actors necessarily in the form of foreigners. Even when you look at within the country, I'm talking about India now, agenda has been largely shaped by other institutions in India in terms of what happens in the Himalayan region. Many of these agencies have been involved in a very centralized mode of generating knowledge and data collection, there is no sharing, and there is very little coordination. And that there is, of course, narrow focus. And I already alluded to that. Certainly, new indigenous institutions are coming. Central State University in Sikkim is one example of that. And again, I want to point out Himalaya is very, very heterogeneous. I am talking only of the Sikkim and Darjeeling region when I'm making many of these comments. And of course, we consider Atri another indigenous institution with a very different approach and with a broader focus. What has shaped Atri's programs? Certainly the need to link global challenges, or I should put it the other way, to link the local challenges with the global challenges. The linkage between poverty and conservation, reconciliation of the need to alleviate poverty, and at the same time, conserve the region's very precious biological resources in the face of global change has been a primary driver of our program, the need for new approaches and institutions, integration of knowledge systems, the traditional knowledge, the modern scientific knowledge, knowledge from different disciplines, and so on and so forth, leadership. We have currently 10 persons, 10 students in our doctor program from Sikkim and Darjeeling alone. And our hope is that during the next 10 years or 15 years, we will have 20 or 30 PhDs in interdisciplinary science and sustainability studies produced under our program. What is our vision for future? We need new institutions. I'm utterly convinced we need new institutions or we need configurations new configurations of existing institutions. We need interdisciplinary usable knowledge. 
that must be linked to improvements in governance and policies. And that must emphasize the development of local leadership and communication. As the first rays of sun hit Kanchanjanga, and the first sunbird comes out for its morning meal, and the small farmer gets up to ponder over the use of local biodiversity, we have unprecedented opportunities to shape the interaction between nature and society. And I think discussions like this we are having, I'm utterly convinced, are going to move us, make us move in that direction. Thank you very much. Okay, I was asked to talk a bit about anthropology, the trajectories of anthropology. Um, that's an extremely um, daunting task, to say the least, especially as I look out uh, at this room at, at uh, so many talented people who would be able to contribute so much. Uh, and there are obviously a good many um, articles and things written about the trajectory of the discipline. I'm going to speak here, first of all, um, about, from my very particular perspective, which, um, in which I take the kind of professional commitment that I have always had to collaborative work with colleagues um, in many parts of the world, but particularly in the parts of the world where I have done my research, uh, to a recognition, and extend that to the idea, to a recognition that uh, any discussion of the trajectory of anthropology, per se, is going to have to uh, be responsive to not only our own national uh, political, economic, and social history uh, as researchers working from a location, uh, but also to the histories of the host countries, the host nations uh, in which we work. And this, I guess I say, I'm sort of taking from Curtis the idea that we have geographies to, to our, our um, scholarship. Uh, but I want to call your attention to two things. So what I have, what I have is the idea is is the idea of a largely blank framework um, that uh, that I would like to try to fill in with a few sort of observations of my own. But then particularly to uh, to solicit and hope that perhaps this framework could be useful for us as a as a collectivity. So I have a, a largely blank framework and a very sketchy set of um, efforts to try to figure out how to do this. Um, obviously, it's easiest to do, so um, the kinds of things that I'd want you to fill in on this sort of framework would be um, other places, right? Um, oops. I'm not an Apple person. Um, uh, but when we talk about these different, um, different um, uh, this different nationalities and then the discipline of, of anthropology itself, it's easiest to do really in the earliest kinds of periods. So if we think about uh, in the earliest stages of, um, of colonial history, Uh, we, and we think particularly in the Himalayas, obviously, um, the first individual who comes to mind, of course, is Hodgson and the kinds of pro projects in which people like Hodgson were involved, um, which were uh, very much embedded and grew from colonial frameworks, uh, concerns about establishing trade, um, uh, securing patterns for administration, uh, in the particular Nepal context, questions about Gurkha recruitment, who could be recruited, who couldn't be recruited. And of course, the very widely and largely discussed um, tension between these early colonial social um, catalogers uh, around ideas of caste and tribe. Um, uh, so the, the question of how these, be, how these catalogs arose, whose purposes they served, um, again, my idea when I say um, that we would have, we'd talk about what the origin, so if we're talking about Hodgson, we would say that he had, was origin and his object there, there was not the current states. It was really more broadly um, Himalayas. Now, we don't really have a, 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 state, a state structure at that point, right? 
um, what was he doing? He was primarily um, cataloging uh, tribes, languages, um, resources, and the purpose was really closely tied to the ideas of um, the, the goals of um, the colonial uh, administration, right? Now, oops. This, I'm, I'm being, I can be fast and as, as uh, uh, my children would probably say loosey-goosey here in the earlier period because none of these colleagues are sitting in this room, all right? So I can get away with saying whatever I want. Uh, when we move into in anthropology, all right, so the earliest periods of sort of pre-professional or professional anthropology, um, we have people like Fuhrer Hammendorf uh, and his field research and, uh, resistant, Bihari Krishna um, Shrestha. Uh, here again is the very first instance from the very earliest periods. I'm sorry, not, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here, getting ahead to Hitchcock. Um, we have Fuhrer Hammendorf and uh, um, largely unnamed um, assistants going with him, still extending a kind of concern about um, about tribal, what I might think of as tribal adventures, um, very much in the colonial tradition. But we also have, in this period of time, emerging from India, um, a series of questions. I like to think of them as the polyandry diaries. Uh, clearly, in terms of the, the project within anthropology, um, we, can, we know that this is a, a tied to um, concerns about uh, social evolutionary theories. And the, the Himalayas had a very particular place in early social evolutionary um, theory making as uh, allegedly one of the few places where polyandry um, what could, be, could be found. Um, again, this period in, within anthropology, professional anthropology, concerns about social evolution, concerns about cataloging world cultures here at Yale um, that, that culminated in the rise of the, the human, um, uh, H-R-A-F, human resource area files. What? Human relations area files, thank you very much. Um, uh, the, um, but at this early period was really, for many people working in the Himalayas, I think a kind of, of cultural categorizing and cataloging and salvage, which was particularly appropriate to the Western imaginaries of the Himalayas as these places sort of lost in time and, and inaccessible, and so in some way standing as living examples, living fossils, if you like. It also um, uh, was the crossroads of a non-trivial number of early anthropologists who really were riding waves of adventure anthropology and particular kinds of nostalgia um, for the untouched, the undiscovered. Uh, uh, the, um, the early, the early post-Second World War period, I think, um, in professional anthropology was a moment of extraordinary enthusiasm and almost hubris, and I think the human relations area files are a good example of that. Uh, in American anthropology, this, of course, uh, resulted in interest in the Himalayas from people like Hitchcock, who were, were particularly interested about cultural ecology and had it, were trying to reinterpret theories of social evolution to talk about um, cultural ecologies. The, uh, uh, on the continent in England, I think the, this turn was a slightly more politically um, acute turn and critical turn, so that we have the work in political economy and materialist history of people like um, of people like the uh, Kaplan and Seddon, and then in Nepal itself we had the um, the collapse of the brief experiment with con uh, with uh, constitutional monarchy and the rise of the Panchayat era. And the Panchayat era, of course, is the era at which um, David Holmberg and myself and many of the uh, anthropologists in this room. Uh, first encountered and began working in Nepal. It, was a, it coincides, of course, with the closure of Tibet to outsiders. Uh, those of us who were working uh, in Nepal in this earlier period were, uh, were very concerned to set ourselves apart 
from the early sort of nostalgia adventure, cataloging tribes, uh, um, kind of anthropology adventure, kinds of anthropology, with the possible exception of who we all knew well, Johann Reinhardt, who was still searching for the Yeti at that time. Uh, but all of us were caught in the, in the throes of what, was, what felt, to me at least, very much like um, doublespeak, professional doublespeak. Um, that is to say, the, the uh, diplomatic circles um, and the press were um, promulgating a view of Nepal in particular as this very um, happy if forgotten place uh, that was held back only by its failure to be developed. Uh, and all of, all, everyone was supposed to throw their energies into development uh, at a moment when, in fact, um, state armature was very much engaged in um, projects of considerable repression, and there was nothing uh, by way of um, uh, what we think of as individual freedoms or, or rights. It is not surprising, then, um, coupled as well with uh, with um, Cold War and post-Cold War sensibilities in America and in Europe, that much of the work in this era, much of the anthropological work of this period in Nepal was distinctly a, or sometimes even anti-political. Anti um, a great deal of work, and that, again, when I say this, it's not to say that it's not important to have work on, on topics like um, religion, gender, personhood, and these, I mean, these are what I've done my whole career, but these are the kinds of topics that flourished uh, in an environment that precluded doing other kinds of, of work. Um, those, uh, it, it's, uh, it's important to remember at that time in wor uh, working in Nepal, uh, there was no freedom of the press. There was no real opportunity for um, an, an energetic um, uh, Nepalese intelligentsia or, or um, journalists. Uh, everyone was supposed to be engaged in this project of national development. Um, the uh, the um, proliferation then of topics, not only uh, the ones that allied with um, larger anthropological turns toward a more reflexive anthropology and an interpretive anthropology and structuralist anthropology, um, all of which are not apolitical, but certainly do not carry the same kind of um, politics that the earlier work of, say, um, Kaplan and Seddon did. Uh, and at this point, we get a, uh, a strong, uh, a large emergence, a wide emergence of interest in, strictly speaking, development topics, development of education, health, uh, social welfare, um, concerns about, the, about, at this point, what, what we were told in the 1970s that was going to be the complete deforestation of the Himalayas by the year 2000. Uh, so that the, um, this, this push, um, I, and I would argue, not coming out of any intellectual trajectory of the discipline of anthropology, but from the fact of our working in states with particular political agendas of their own. And again, I think if you were going to do this looking at India, um, you would have to start looking at what happened in India to anthropology, let's say during um, Indira Gandhi's emergency uh, and following that, or in, in Sikkim um, uh, pre and prior to uh, political changes there. And of course, Tibet very, very radically in terms of what kinds of opportunities there were for foreign researchers and what kinds of opportunities there were for indigenous scholars, very particular kinds of local histories. And this is um, especially apparent in Nepal uh, in this Panchayat period. This was, of course, the period in um, Kathmandu when Tribune University was established. And then sometime after that, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology um, at that university itself established very explicitly, and you can see it um, quite, quite clearly in the curriculum and the kind of work that people um, did, to be harnessed to objectives uh, of, and this is sort of, this is the double speak of the time, uh, objectives of national development on the one hand and national unity on the other hand. Uh, so we have two parallel, two very different kinds of things coming out of this. The successful history, extraordinarily successful history of community forestry uh, from anthropologists, sociologists in Nepal. Um, at the same time, 
that the, um, uh, the sort of uh, the dawn of uh, Nepalese anthropology, Dora Bahadur Bista, um, it, whether this is apocryphal or not, it, it suits my story well, uh, was um, um, not permitted to publish his uh, original book as, under the title Peoples, plural of Nepal, but rather as it appeared, People of Nepal. Uh, so that the, the, um, these agendas, the, as I say, it's partly my own personal um, commitment to the idea that as anthropologists, our work sh should be deeply collaborative, but it's also a very pr profound re um, realization that when, when we collaborate, we are simultaneously collaborating at two different levels. One is at the community level of our own work and with the, those communities and their situations, but the other, and equally and sometimes um, more importantly constraining, with the nation states and their laws and their permissions and their procedures and the possibilities that are presented for our colleagues in that context. Uh, it was explicitly um, a, uh, um, a stricture of anthropologists working in Nepal uh, for a very long time, and indeed it is technically still on the books, that a copy of all of your field notes, photographs, field recordings, um, audio, anything, be left with the research, with the research um, division at the university. And I think there is no anthropologist in the room, um, however eager to uh, collaborate productively with colleagues, would feel comfortable leaving copies of their field notes, et cetera, et cetera, with precisely the state that was responsible for um, very repressive actions in many of the communities in which we worked. So this, this notion that I am deeply committed to that we should be operating collaboratively, I want to make clear um, that as we look at these national trajectories, that that not be a sort of a naive, pat yourself on the back, um, uh, do-gooder point of view. And this becomes uh, very, very acutely clear as we move into the, sh in the shift into democratic Nepal. So you can see I'm sort of suggesting that we need a framework that obviously is chronological and is substantive um, tracing trajectories within our own disciplines from colonial projects to salvage projects uh, to attempting to theorize society uh, and culture as a whole and in th those projects from projects that organize them according to social evolution, then cultural ecology, um, and then through the what, what anthropologists refer to as the reflexive turn, more awareness of the politics of representation and our own culpability um, in that. But um, all of that, that, in one sense, that's a temporal progression. But in another sense, it's a very explicitly dialogical um, uh, uh, progression within that time sequence. And it, cha it matters whether you're working in the state of India or in um, the state of China or in the state of Nepal uh, in terms of how the possibilities for that research um, unfolds. To look, uh, so just as uh, prior to the emergence of, or <laughs> the reemergence, or the third or fourth iteration of the attempts to cause the reemergence of a democratic Nepal, um, just as <laughs> prior to that, I'm just about that, prior to that, um, uh, anthropologists uh, were uh, compelled to. Uh, uh, and did accept ideologies more or less of isolation and timelessness. Post 1990s anthropology has very, very vigorously rejected this. Um, it's at this point that I imagined, um, as those of you who saw the recent American ethnologist and have seen Laura Ahern's new work, I thought I would go through the old Himalayan research bulletin and do a wordle, right, of all of the titles of dissertations that had come from anthropology. Uh, since we don't have them quite so nicely cataloged as some of Curtis's um, things in Virginia. Uh, and certainly uh, there are major shifts. Um, this post-reflexiveness has resulted, or there is, you know, along with that, there are many, many more um, exciting uh, Nepalese colleagues producing work of their own. Uh, and many of us have been much more involved with the uh, the training and co-publication with colleagues. So the kind of tension that uh, existed 
between John Hitchcock and um, his researcher Bihari Krishna, we don't we aren't confronted with that anymore. Um, as I think everyone knows, Bihari Krishna tried very hard to get into PhD programs and was not successful. Um, above all, post 1990s, politics is okay again. In fact, politics is kind of de rigueur. Uh, the politics of um, diversity uh, is no longer cataloging. Um, Personhood has become identity politics. Um, ethnic communities are no longer static tribes, but very dynamic players in the formation of New Nepal. Uh, state histories are no longer uh, simply a question of how laws shaped um, social perceptions, as in the very early and very important um, study uh, of the Muliki Ein by our German colleague. Uh, but instead are um, dynamic studies of how communities interact um, in, in, creating, um, in creating those states' histories. What in anthropology became concerns about the politics of representation um, in Nepal intertwined with very, very rapid, rapid changes in access to publication and to the press and to media. Um, modernity hit nowhere in the world so rapidly and so um, palpably as uh, parts of Nepal, which were um, not isolated but um, by geography and the forgetfulness of time, but by politics. So that um, global changes um, in terms of urbanization and migratory patterns have really left, I think, um, a very um, bewildering but exciting mark on uh, anthropology in Nepal. We now have, um, if, if when, in the period of time when I started working, if I found myself confronted with a very troubling double speak, um, today uh, it's a very, it's a much more multitudinous world. Uh, in the time when David and I started working, of course, it took months for an aerogram um, to make it to and from Nepal, and only about two thirds of them ever did. Um, scholars now working in the Himalayas uh, are connected through email, Skype, phone, cell phones. It's a, it's a, it's a, it creates possibilities for the kind of collaborative engagement that I think is important, but in um, some very startling ways. I'd like to conclude just by saying that uh, from the perspective of the academy, academic anthropology has two, um, two very and some important but sometimes contradictory um, responsibilities. One is a custodial one, and this is to, um, to attempt to record, to preserve, to archive um, lots of, uh, of information about communities for them and ourselves. And the second, of course, is to generate new knowledge about social formations. Um, but in this, I think that I would, um, exhort everyone to avoid what one colleague of mine re referred to as private acts of self-replication. Uh, there are some very special challenges um, confronting us doing ethnographic and anthropological work in Nepal, not the least of which is um, the challenges from the uh, production of ethnography outside the academy. Uh, beginning in the period of the 70s, as academic anthropology produced many, many more students than it produced jobs, um, there's been a, 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 a great proliferation of sometimes very good ethnographic work done from outside of the academy. Some of this um, in, from the explicitly development world, which in many ways is better funded than our academic world. Uh, and in this we can think particularly not only of the World Bank study on exclusion, but also the current first ever ethnographic survey of Nepal um, being done by a young indigenous scholar, Mukta uh, Singh Lama Tamang. He's here somewhere. There you are. <laughs> uh, um, who uh, is, I think, a, an, um, an important personal exemplar of the changes that have occurred in the discipline um, not only as these, uh, the production of ethnography outside of the activity, ac academy grows, um, but also as individuals who uh, come from what were previous, previously so-called target um, communities themselves become involved in production of ethnography and production of, of self-representations. 
Uh, it's, uh, it's important, I think, that uh, anthropology uh, has worked throughout its time in the Himalayas with populations of people who have been uh, very systematically marginalized through those histories. And it's especially important that people from those communities today are um, involved now in producing uh, their own ethnographies. So I stop um, with this very inchoate set of thoughts, suggesting simply that as we think about our trajectory intellectually in the discipline, that we do not just look at intellectual developments and movements from structuralism to postmodernism um, within the discipline, but that we really ask ourselves very carefully what kind of terms uh, or conditions um, were imposed or surrounded us uh, in the context where we were working, and especially to ask what kind of terms and conditions those imposed upon our colleagues uh, and our so-called subjects in producing um, representations of themselves. So thank you. But uh, I'll try to keep things fairly short and, and actually, fortunately, um, uh, all three speakers so far have made a number of points which I was going to refer to in various ways so that, that can perhaps shorten things a little. Um, Shivi introduced me at the beginning primarily as a historian and, and, and as an archaeologist. Uh, these are two disciplines that I, I have spent a little bit of time being engaged with, but I really don't have any claims to represent. Um, I must say I've not been very good at boundaries over my <laughs> life generally, but um, my, my own um, uh, academic career started off uh, primarily in anthropology. And that's where most of my work has, has been also in, in, in uh, terms of scholarly location. And more recently, I've spent some time in, in religion departments, which, is, as Curtis notes, have, have very interesting demands of their own. Um, however, my anthropological career, I suppose, has been somewhat different from Cathy, if only that most of it has been in Australia and in the UK, and that the centre of gravity has been more in Tibet and less in Nepal. So uh, I'll start with the, the question of how the, the, the study of the uh, Himalaya has been guided by disciplinary concerns. Um, I think this was something that I got confronted by pretty early on in the game, at the point when I was beginning to work in Tibetan studies, uh, around 1970, since the, the literature I was reading at that stage uh, was already very clearly divided into two quite different disciplinary components. I was working on Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and there was a, a body of material from anthropology, there was a body of material from Buddhist studies, a larger one, and essentially they seemed to be talking about two almost completely different places. Um, I don't know if any of you read uh, China Mierville's novel, The City and the City, I've been reading it recently. This is a, a novel about a, uh, a city which is experienced in completely different ways by two, uh, it's actually uh, two cities that are located in precise, on precisely the same piece of territory. And the populations of the two cities have each uh, acquired the ability to unsee the other. So they're, they're living in the same place, but actually living in two, different, uh, two completely different places. And uh, this, is, this is an image that I was thinking of quite a bit in the course of, of preparing for the, this, this seminar. Uh, since I've often found myself in a situation where things look rather like this. And um, this isn't to say that the anthropological side of Tibetan religion uh, in those days was, was necessarily uniform in its approach. It was quite the opposite. This included people like Fura Heimendorf from on the Sherpas, uh, Robert Eckvall in Amdo, Sherry Ortner again on the Sherpas, who, who actually had extremely different concerns and, and interests though they did tend to, sh to share the obsession with religion that uh, uh, I think has been one of the major problems of Tibetan studies as a whole. Not to say that religion isn't a, a fascinating business, uh, but there's a lot more to Tibet which has uh, only, I think, much more gradually come into focus. I think Cathy's point about uh, politics and the way in which this has defined certain things as being very difficult to study uh, is, is a, quite an important one here. 
So on the, the Buddhist side, you had the textual scholars such as Snellgrove, uh, Alex Wayman, Herbert Gunter, and so on, um, who were portraying a very, very different place. So on, uh, they were talking about a highly refined, sophisticated literature uh, about philosophy and complex spiritual practices. Uh, the anthropologists were talking mostly about a lay population of villagers who uh, didn't actually seem very different in their own pragmatic orientation to religion uh, from the sub-Saharan African peoples that most of my own anthropological education had been about. Uh, so uh, a lot of my, my own early work was a, a struggle to try to, to fit these things together. Um, and uh, I think there are a number of other uh, areas within the general region where one can run into very similar things. Uh, a few years later, I was looking at uh, a region of the world surface which you could describe as either Eastern Tibet or Western Sichuan, depending on your preference. And you could read two almost completely different literatures about it, depending on which you chose. Um, more recently, I became involved somewhat in Bangladeshi studies after being fairly in, uh, reading quite a lot of, of uh, the anthropology of India over the years. And uh, you find yourself uh, reading literatures which are talking about what seem like very similar people but have completely different concerns. On, on the one side, you, you have uh, caste and hierarchy and religion. On the other side, you have development issues and, and social inequality and politics. And things that seem to be... They, uh, and you begin to have a sense of how the, uh, both the wider disciplinary programs and the, the more specific uh, histories of, of, of study within particular areas have dictated quite different concerns and, and rendered different things visible and different things invisible and, uh, un invisible and unseen. Um, so my own work early on was try trying to fit the, the various views of Tibet into something like a, a a coherent whole that might make sense of, 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 of all, or, or at least several of them. What I didn't do so much in those days, and what was certainly lacking in the wider disciplinary context, was to move into the self-conscious analysis of disciplinary histories and into the critique of the, the analytic frames uh, that were generating it. Though I did give an early paper in 1989 which was reflecting on just why people weren't thinking about what they were doing very much and suggesting myself then that this reflected some of the political imperatives that invested the field of Tibetan studies. In fact, in that paper, I went on to suggest that one way to escape from the, the Ampas was to look at the relationship with the Southeast Asian Highland societies and that they were a major untapped resource in, in trying to make sense of Tibetan societies and precisely in highlighting some of the aspects which the, the religious and Dharmic and Buddhist frame tended to, to, to miss. Um, uh, and a lot of things about Tibet might best be understood by seeing it as a Southeast Asian Highland society, not as a Buddhist society, whatever that was. Um, all this actually prefigured some of the issues that, that came up more recently in the work of Philip Van Skendel and, and James Scott on, on, on Somia. And it's, uh, it's very nice to see this agenda being opened up again in that context. I suspect we may be talking more about Zomia as the weekend progresses. Um, I think most of us who've been involved with that literature would probably agree that it's meant many different things to different people, and it's gone off in many strange and wonderful directions over the last few years. Uh, some of them perhaps dead ends, but it's, it's certainly revitalized the whole area and produced some very interesting studies. And in particular, I think it's brought the whole question of alternate geographies very much to the fore how do you construct, what is the, the area which you're, you're looking at in your, in your study? And I suppose I, I could have had some PowerPoints with, with lots of nice maps, but I decided, given the limitations in time, that I was probably better off keeping to words. Um, in fact, if you move from Tibet down to Nepal and to the, the higher Himalayan regions of Nepal, um, things already look quite a bit different. Uh, in part because, by and large, Tibetanists and Buddhologists in those days weren't very interested in, in, in that region. Um, of course, there were, uh, I, I guess one should note, two major exceptions, David Snellgrove, who, who Curtis has already talked about, and, and uh, another, Sandy MacDonald. 
uh, who did a great deal in later years to open up the detailed anthropological study of Himalayan populations in, in France in particular. But by and large, Tibetanists in those days weren't very interested in place at all. Um, Gunter did some of his early work in, in Lahul in uh, northeast India, but it's very difficult to get any traces of, of Lahul out of what he writes about and, and so on. Um, whereas in Nepal, uh, since the anthropologists didn't have this kind of constant interface with, with, with Tibetanists who had other stories, Buddhists who had other stories about what they were doing, uh, this, this kind of, of uh, negotiation didn't need to take place. Uh, and I think there was a progressive move um, from, I remember when I started looking at this literature in the 1970s, people were still talking about the Indo-Tibetan interface and the, the Nepal highlands as some kind of zone which could be understood by mixing a bit of Tibet with a bit of, 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 uh, of India. Um, but increasingly over time, people came to recognize that people like the Tamang and Gurung and, and so on were, were not ad hoc mixtures of Buddhist influences and Hindu influences, but made sense in their own terms. And, and then, as Kathy pointed out, you, uh, the gradual move towards seeing those identities as, as much more fluid and historically constructed. So I think in some ways there is a kind of logic to the development of, of anthropology in Nepal, which is, is quite rewarding. But it still does leave us with the, uh, the, the question of what do you deal with more generalizing or, or localizing projects. Um, so, the, um, the other question which, which I think I was picking up, particularly on here, was the, the role of, of Subdisciplinary areas within anthropology, um, the development of, of uh, again, uh, Kathy talked about the uh, the emphasis on personhood and identity and and and, and um, issues in and religion in, in in the early work, which in many ways reflected what you could and couldn't do. Um, the development in more recent years of medical anthropology as a major interest in much of Himalayan studies and, uh, and of ecological anthropology in, in more recent times, again, uh, partly a response to, to some of the issues that, that uh, Kamal was talking about. Um, on the question of how institutional configurations shape scholarly production, I've already alluded to the the double vision of Eastern Tibetan and, and, and uh, uh, Western China, and Western Sichuan, two largely different places that coexisted in the same territory. These sorts of issues work at many different levels. Um, for example, the fact that Tibetan studies in the US Academy uh, tends to take place mainly at the American Academy of Religion, secondarily at the uh, American Anthropological Association, <laughs> Uh, meetings and often only marginally at the Association of Asian Studies reflects a whole history of, of, um, of local gatekeepers and possibilities for, for uh, scholarly work. For example, the fact that uh, much of the, uh, the, the, t the Tibetan region was for many years uh, uh, at the AAS, something that fell under the area of Sinology. Um, and so all these things have quite complex, sometimes positive, sometimes more, more problematic um, product, uh, results, uh, and lead to certain questions being important for certain groups, certain, certain issues being worth pursuing or, or difficult to pursue. It's always difficult to fully disentangle the structural and the personal in these matters, but I think equally they have had a lot of effect on what we've been doing in the past. Um, but again, I'm rather conscious of time, um, I'd like to, um, to say something uh, in the, the later parts of this, this talk about what the future looks like. Um, and clearly the sorts of priorities and political structures that have invested uh, Himalayan studies have changed over the years. Uh, so the things like international aid budgets and, and development funding and, and the concerns that they've had. 
Um, but one thing that has been particularly striking has been the growth of the environmental and sustainability agenda. Um, and this is where I found Camel's presentation um, very valuable because I think it's clear that we have here something which has the potential to generate a new and overarching framework that both has serious intellectual content and uh, can be a powerful driving force towards integrating many of the concerns that a lot of us have been working with. And, and I think a corollary to this is something which, which again, Cathy um, alluded to, which is the, uh, the sense that collaboration with colleagues in South Asia and in the Himalayas has now taken on a very different form from what it was in, in the, the early days when, uh, when one could work with unnamed research assistants, possibly occasionally named research assistants, but the Western scholar still had a dominance over the, the scholarly production, which, which uh, was, was relatively unquestioned. Um, we're now, I think, increasingly working in a much more equal structure of collaboration. And while people on both, si on both or the many sides of these collaborations are not necessarily always speaking the same language in theoretical or intellectual terms, um, at least I think we have increasingly common concerns and increasing possibilities of dialogue. Um, and I think this is setting up a very complex dynamic, often one that's quite difficult to work with because we do have state authorities with their own political interests in this too, but one which is also um, potentially extremely rewarding. Um, and I think um, scholars from places like Nepal and Bhutan, for example, are um, coming from uh, different intellectual backgrounds are, are living very different kinds of, of uh, academic lives. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and and um, often working in a, a much more applied and engaged context than, than uh, scholars in the West are. Um, but this, uh, this is, so if this is a very different scene from the one that we're used to, I've been seeing it to some extent in the Bhutan context. I'm sure many of you have been seeing it elsewhere in the Himalayas. I think that it's also one that is potentially very productive. And, and I think it fits also with a wider academic scene, even in the West, where we're beginning to have a sense that the whole business of academic production needs a lot of rethinking and resituating and reevaluating if it's going to continue to be a functional part of Western societies and of global society. So, I mean, for me, one of, one of the, the big questions at this point is what could something like Himalayan studies be doing that is really um, adequate and appropriate to the sorts of demands that are facing the Himalayas themselves? at this point in time and facing the people that we are talk talking with, working with and talking about. Um, I think we need increasingly to stop seeing the conventional structure of the disciplines altogether as driving our research and much more, uh, I think it's much more appropriate to talk about what the people who we're studying are going to need and use over the, the times uh, that, that are coming. And I think we need to set up collaborative contexts in which we can talk about that. One of the issues that I've been thinking about a lot in, in recent times is, is how, what might be a, a, a meaningful academic curriculum at the present point in time uh, for universities, both in the Himalayas and, and for that matter in the West that are dealing with the Himalayas. I think if we see the Himalayas as a context to develop a new, a new and much more collaborative and grounded approach to academic work, and I'm aware I'm going a little bit out on a limb here, but I think it's perhaps worth saying some of these things, um, and a, a context in which the big contemporary issues that the Himalayan peoples are facing can constitute our starting point, then we could find ourselves very much part of the, the cutting edge of, it, of academic work in, in years to come. And 
I'd like to suggest that maybe one thing this meeting could be doing is thinking a little bit about some of those future directions and where they might take us. Okay, I'll stop there for this. I don't want to keep you from the break, so I'll be brief, and my voice may well give out. <laughs> Oh, well, all right, thank you. Thank you for the time, but I'll, I'll try to be short. Well, I come to you from far away, uh, intellectually that is, although I am here at Yale, and I can only give you a far away view of the Himalayas, uh, but I look forward to learning from all of you who have a close-up perspective. I'm a historian of China in the Qing Dynasty from the 17th to the 19th century. The closest I've been to the Himalayas was the city of Xining in the Chinese province of Qinghai, you know, the Kumbu Monastery is right there, and it dates from the 16th century. It's 1,200 miles from Lhasa, but now there is a railroad there, of course, that the Chinese have built. It is on the eastern edge of the Tibetan Plateau at an elevation of 7,000 feet, so arguably there is some connection, at least, between the Xining and the Himalayas, but that is the closest I've ever been to this region. I think that, though, however, all the speakers this morning recognize that the larger world and the smaller worlds are closely connected to each other. And I just want to give a couple, two examples of what the Himalayas look like from a distance, from the historian's temporal distance and a spatial distance, uh, and how events there might have very far-reaching repercussions. Uh, I wrote a book on the expansion of the Qing Dynasty, its conquest of Mongolia and Xinjiang in the 17th and 18th centuries, and Tibet figured very importantly in that story. Uh, Tibetan Lamaism was very influential among the Mongols. The Qing had very strong imperatives to patronize the Lamaist church, and it intervened in Tibetan politics very uh, abruptly and brutally at times. Qing armies invaded Lhasa in 1720. They attacked the great temple complex at uh, Xining and nearly razed it to the ground at one point. They controlled trade routes between Mongolia and Tibet. So even from far away Beijing, Tibetan affairs were quite significant in the 17th and 18th centuries. We now also do have new sources becoming available on this from somewhat surprising places. Uh, the Lhasa archives are not really yet available to scholars, but the Beijing archives have published Manchu sources related to Tibet, for example, uh, most remarkably about this uh, so-called manja tea trade that went from Mongolia to Lhasa via Xining. This was a key trade route uh, in the 18th century that the Qing had to control, and they used this to try to cut off uh, supplies and links between the Dzungar Mongols and Lhasa. So uh, it may be disheartening for some of you to know that Manchu is a useful language to uh, study Tibet, but, but that's a feature of this field, I think. We need uh, collaboration and a wide variety of different linguistic uh, skills to get a grasp on this incredibly complex uh, region. Uh, the second example is a student of mine who just completed a dissertation on early PRC policy toward Tibet in the 1950s uh, based on newly opened archives. And he found that there was originally a rather flexible policy towards people crossing the border in Nepal and Tibet. He calls this empire light. Uh, there was fairly significant negotiation with India. There were widely uh, disparate trade routes crossing this border, but this changed to a much more hardline position by the late 1950s when the PRC shut down the border trade, it heavily damaged the livelihoods of people in Tibet and Nepal and the entire region, uh, and left even people stranded along the border with no specific uh, nationality. It was very hard for the PRC to figure out exactly where these people belonged. These heavy-handed measures in the Himalayan border, he argues, seriously damaged the image of the PRC among third world peoples. The goodwill created by the Bandung Conference of 1955 dissipated very quickly uh, because of this PRC crackdown. So I think the position of the PRC in the world in the late 50s was severely affected by its reactions to events on the border with Tibet. That's his main thesis, and I think it's an important argument that, again, once again, affairs in this region do have even uh, global repercussions. So I think we can and we should take a maybe long-term spatial and temporal view to complement the close-up view that we've had. And I see that echoed in many of the discussions we have here. Uh, Curtis Schaefer's argument is very uh, germane since right here in this room last week we had a talk by a, our newly arriving digital humanities librarian who uh, promoted the idea of what is called distant reading of the uh, literary critic Franco Moretti 
vain ideas. As he said, we have a huge mass now of uh, digitized online materials or materials to be scanned, far more than any of us can ever read. How do we manage this material? There are computer statistical techniques now. Topic modeling is one of them he advocates that are being used in literary studies in the West and can well be applied now in other areas, for example, to this enormous quantity of uh, digitized Chinese uh, material about uh, Tibet and other places. I think uh, Mr. Bawa's linkage of the global and the local likewise shows, of course, that there are multiple scales of analysis, and this is very apparent in the scientific study of sustainability and global climate change, that uh, small-scale changes on the ground are clearly a result of very large global changes. Uh, uh, the anthropologist, Ms. Marx, said the anthropology in Nepal is a product of larger political uh, developments uh, in the world, has shaped the discipline in a number of ways. And as uh, Mr. Samuel said, uh, there are different disciplinary orientations that can even uh, create widely disparate perspectives on the same place, uh, coming from different uh, kinds of uh, questions. So in general, I think that all of the speakers and my own orientation here is to try to make an effort to link together very large scale and distant views of the Himalayas with those of people who would look at it from the very close ground up. So thanks. <clears throat> I am Eklavia Sharma from ECMOD. Uh, my question is directed to Professor Bawa. Excellent presentation. You talked about the state extractive activities which was going against the interest of the communities. I, and you gave the example of tea and timber. I think private sector is equally important here. And in your future uh, visioning and uh, working of ATRI, how you are designing private sector engagement. We see in terms of development in the Himalayan region, the private sector are taking a major role nowadays. So we need to bring them on board. So this mm -hmm. is my question, whether he answers now or later well, on. Well, we'll treat, take that as a valuable observation that in beyond considering state and community, which have traditionally been the focus of a lot of work, uh, we must take private enterprise and activity into, especially corporate private enterprise and activity into consideration. That's, I think that's a very opposite uh, point. Yes, anybody else? Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, David Holmberg. Um, uh, in talking about uh, particularly anthropological uh, disciplinary uh, histories, uh, I, you know, there's a lot of discussion within anthropology these days. Um, and this is more of a comment than a question. Um, you know, what is the field? And it's really quite incoherent in, in many respects. There's a lot of argument within the discipline about what uh, you know, exactly it is. One of the things that seemed to unite this was, well, we do ethnography. And that somehow ethnography has become kind of the um, the, the, we're, we're organizing, so much like archaeologists dig, anthropologists somehow do, um, uh, do ethnography. And some would add to that ethnography in combination with something like social theory. But it seems in the terms of, of anthropology, this ethnography is like critical to, to think about in uh, the uh, history of the Right. Uh, anybody else? Yes, please. Uh, Michael Hutt from SOAS. Um, two things relating to Kath March's uh, pr very interesting presentation. One is just to defend my my countryman uh, Brian Hodgson from the accusations of being <laughs> simply a cataloguer. Um, we have catalogued, as you know, um, all the archive of his papers in the British Library, and you can access that uh, via the Digital Himalaya website, um, which demonstrate the extent to which he's actually you know, founded the whole tradition of Himalayan studies in a sense, particularly with his, his very in-depth study of Mahayana Buddhism, which is very much more than cataloging. The other thing to, just to mention is, um, just to endorse uh, what Kath and, other, and Jeffrey Samuel has said about the way in which um, in recent decades um, the, the manner of, of scholarship has changed into a much more dialogic and collaborative kind of enterprise with, uh, with colleagues in the region. And I think one thing I'd love to see one day is, is some kind of analysis from the region of the kind of scholarship that is produced by people from outside the region and some discussion about, you know, are we actually choosing the themes that are relevant to them or are they 
or are they simply more reflective of our own disciplinary kind of trajectories and concerns you know, back here in the Western metropolis? Anybody else have any thoughts on this panel? We, we could probably have some quick responses in that case, right? Okay. Come on, did you want to answer a question since it's directly addressed to you? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify. I was not saying, you know, the interests of the state. I mean, the community the state is necessarily acting against the interests of the community. I think, of course, communities do benefit greatly from many of the state activities. I think it was a question of you know, whether state is driving the management of resources versus the community also, you know, what is the role of communities in driving the management of resources. I think the private uh, involvement of private sector is, is a very appropriate comment, but I think until, you know, the first thing is the community interests have to come, and that has to be the primary interest, and the communities then have to determine along with the state, to what extent the private sector comes in, and not just the state itself. Catherine, do you want to respond? Sure. Um, I, of course, I, Hodgson is a really complicated and wonderful, wonderful case. And in fact, um, I think one of the things that's particularly interesting in some of the frameworks, both his, um, his work on religion, but particularly his work on the manners and customs of various, is, is um, the, the, the very clear, important role that his scribe, translator, interlocutors had. So that um, if we were really going to complicate the, this, the, the production of, uh, and I take David's point, of course, very um, dear to heart, of ethnography, that it isn't just the outsider um, interacting with some um, homogenous inside framework. But in the case of Hodgins, I mean, you have these, I, I think what would probably, the, the word subaltern probably applies quite, quite well here, um, interlocutors whose influence, at least in the stuff that I've looked in, the manners and customs pieces, really turned it to being a life cycle ritual study, which I don't think necessarily came from Hodgson himself at all, but probably very much came from these, these uh, presumably higher caste, uh, Kathmandu-based, either Newar or Kas um, interlocutors or translators through which he was doing it. Um, and I think you'll notice in, in response to David's question, um, the, um, there's a great deal of slippage in my own use of the word anthropology as opposed to ethnography, um, just in general. Uh, and But I do think you could make a rather even more complicated story about the, um, the uh, somewhat more privileged position of ethnography in the Himalayas, uh, in part coming out of these feet of clay uh, in this idea of all these isolated little valleys. In some sense, somewhat anachronistically, both because of the relatively um, severely imposed, whether it's by the government of Nepal um, or uh, by China, uh, politically enforced isolation of Nepal per se. I mean, they were way behind in public communication, in road transport, all kinds of things that would have connected um, people more um, immediately and obviously with each other and with the world. Uh, so a, I, I think actually a fair number of people uh, it chose to go to Nepal because there still was this sense that there were places that weren't described. And so, um, in a sense, the, 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 the clay feet of ethnography in terms of just of creating these descriptions, uh, there was much more of a sense, I think, in Nepal that we needed those descriptions that it hadn't been done. Um, and that occurring with the sort of critiques of ethnography in the West meant that you have some very, very good ethnographies being produced in, in parts of Nepal um, that, uh, that were could some in some sense that discussion could continue in Nepal in a way that it couldn't in quite the same way in say um, Native North America or um, Africa or other places. Mm -hmm. Did you want to respond to that too? Uh, Yes, well, I think perhaps I need to add that, of course, that, that leaves the question of where are we now in relation to something like ethnography. 
uh, in Nepal and in much of the rest of the, the Himalayas. And uh, I agree, I mean, there's sense that there still were places where you could do quite conventional kinds of field work fairly late on. Uh, um, did lead to some very productive and, and, and very useful work, but it also sidelined some quite important issues about what we might be doing now. And, um, I find myself very worried about the word ethnography at all these days, in, in part because it's become so, so devalued in so many non-anthropological contexts, but of course also very much questioned within the anthropological. Do that. <laughs> oh. If you Google, if anyone tries Googling Well, I mean, devalued. You get, you get, there are many more kids in business schools. I know. No, this is exactly what I mean. I mean, it's, it's become, this, well, it's, it's valued in the sense that people think there is something there, but, but what it is they think is there is very hard to say. Okay, so I'm going to take uh, probably one more observation from the floor and then make a concluding observation uh, before we go for tea. Yeah, both sides. Yeah, both sides from Heidelberg. I just, I think it's important since our time is uh, limited to try to uh, say something provocative and, um, that is, you know, we're here together to try to think about what Himalayan studies might look like. And that's a very difficult thing because there's so much cultural, historical, religious diversity and so forth. And what we've had on the panel is kind of exemplary of the conference. We've had Nepal and Tibet. Um, and, you know, how do you, the Himalayas is not Tibet, it's not Nepal, it's much broader than that. And how do you actually formulate a program of Himalayan studies? Is it possible at all? The only thing that's been mentioned, and Jeffrey alluded to that too, and both of, and, and Mr. Bala, is the environmental dimension. The Himalayas are, after all, a mountain range in a particular environmental niche. And it seems to me, as I'll say tomorrow, that this is the place one would have to start to make something like Himalayan studies that was independent of national nationalities and uh, religious tradition. Thank you, Bo. Uh, before we close, I just wanted to add, uh, of course, thanks to all our panelists for their wonderful presentations. It, it was interesting, I think, to hear <coughs> and then uh, hear them and then hear Peter, a historian of China, uh, reflect on their, th their remarks because it reminded me of something actually Kathy had said as well, which is that Himalayan studies, if I'm understanding this correctly, began in a colonial moment or a colonial period when two things were happening. One is uh, there was uh, the rise of systematics in a variety of disciplines, uh, natural sciences, social sciences, and so forth. And uh, this uh, systematics and the establishment of colonial empire in the region encountered the massive biological, cultural, and linguistic diversity that Kamal spoke about and others that Bo has remarked on as well. And this might have led to an extended phase uh, of uh, writing about the region in, in terms that were largely classificatory. Uh, and uh, it took almost 100 years, shall we say, to get into other modes of analysis, though these modes remain important and for reasons that are newly relevant, like, for instance, climate change. Uh, so. Uh, it's good to be reminded that the region is constituted as much by things like long distance trade, uh, wars and geopolitics and so on, uh, top topics which for a variety of reasons both to do with the emergence of relevant disciplines but also constraints placed on researchers were not easily addressed for a long time. And it would be important to try and address them now uh, in this time when we're trying to come back together across disciplines, across fields, in a new historical moment when several of these Himalayan societies are also looking for new futures. So uh, that's why I feel very hopeful and excited about what lies ahead for all of you and what we might all learn from this. But for now, let's take a break and re, uh, recharge our batteries. Thank you very much.